I believe that if it's meant to be, it will be. That as long as I'm doing my part, I do think that things will happen, that things will work out for me. My hearing sister used to teach us um, how, to, how to lip sync. And so I, we would play around at home. She was always the performer at home, but she couldn't perform in front of people. Where I would learn how to perform from her, and I could still do it in front of people. My parents found out that I was deaf at an early age, but I'm not sure exactly when. But it seemed that they found out around the age of three, and I went to school at a special program where in the mornings I learned English uh, language skills, and then in the afternoon I was put in a um, mainstream class. I went to hearing schools all through junior high and high school, became a cheerleader in junior high school, and that's when I started opening up again because I was still shy. I think the problem I had in school was that sometimes my teacher did not really understand the profoundness of my hearing impairment. With hearing aids, I heard a lot, but it didn't mean that I understood what I was hearing. When I graduated from high school, I didn't want to go to college. And um, the reason I didn't want to was because I didn't think there was any reason for it. That was the first time I said, aha, you know, my hearing impairment could be uh, a detriment. So I went to RIT, and that was my first exposure to, since I was eight, to other deaf people and um, to the deaf culture. So the first night I got there, my sister was already there. I don't think I would have gone if she wasn't there already, because um, she made the unknown less frightening. And we were roommates my first quarter. So I, I went in, you know, winter quarter and uh, people were coming back. I didn't go in in the summertime. And all of my sister's friends were in the room and most of them were deaf and they were signing and they weren't speaking. And I knew they were talking about psychology, which was my favorite subject. And so I was watching for a while and I couldn't lip read because some people were signing without lip, you know, movement. So after a while I thought, <laughs> I can't handle this. So I started doing laundry down in the laundry room and um, feeling sorry for myself and thinking I'm never going to fit in. I remember I met a boy named Bruce, Bruce from Florida, who was very nice and he cheered me up a little bit and he said, you know, you'll get used to it. And um, I think that night I decided that I was going to learn to sign and no more sitting outside like that. <music> Children of a Lesser God, the play, was being done at that time in New York, the bus and truck tour and the national tour. And they were looking for more people to play the roles of Sarah and Lydia. So they came to NTID. My teachers encouraged me to audition and I said, I can't do that. But I went ahead and auditioned. And then uh, that was in March, I guess. And then in August, I hadn't heard anything from them. They called me and said, can you be ready within 24 hours in San Francisco? And at that time, I was engaged, and I was going into my last year of college and ready. You know, my future was set. But I just said, oh, God, yes. And I left. Within 24 hours, I was on a plane flying to San Francisco to play the role of Lydia. When I finished with Children of a Lesser God, I had decided, OK, this is it. So I went back to school, um, danced, did shows, and then decided that I wanted to move to L.A. when I graduated, which I did. I moved here, and within a month had gotten the role of um, Carrie on MacGyver. I did one episode, one, it was the, um, the guest starring role, and it was, it was a big role. And I was terrified because I had never done that type of thing before. It was a lot of action. I did some of my own stunts. And in that show, I started learning because, I mean, that, Time is money. They didn't have time to waste. So it was a matter, a matter of me being able to understand what was going on and doing it. I mean, they expected me to be a professional, which I am, I think. But at that time, I hadn't done anything major, so I didn't know. Could I do it? 
More recently, um, I did the show called Throb. That's a half hour situation comedy. I had never done comedy before. I had never taped live like that. I had no idea what to expect. And I was frankly terrified. I mean, I wanted the role, I knew I could do it, but then I got there and it was like, well, what do I do? I kept forgetting that once you performed on stage, you can perform anywhere. Would you like to go out with me? Go out with me? Uh -huh. <laughs> Why would you think I would consider that a reward? <laughs> you don't even know me. Oh, I know. But I'd like to. There's something different about you. Give me a break. <laughs> Come on. Yes. Mm. Boy. Come on. Date a jerk. Be the first one on your block. <laughs> Come on, it'd be fun. We have so much in common. Like, we're both deaf. You're just a visitor. I live here. All the more reason for you to show me around. <laughs> Maybe we should just forget this. Oh, baby, just throw me out of your mind. Now, the role that I played recently on Throb, that of a hearing-impaired audiologist, was a breakthrough. And it didn't dwell on my deafness. It, I was a person first, and that's important. Because, you know, the fact that I'm deaf is not nearly as important as the fact that I like to swim, I like my shrimps. I mean, it's important, but it should not be the whole thing about me. My father had learned to play several musical instruments, and I was singing when I was more boy for years. I became deaf poetry, became my substitute for music. And because in poetry, especially way back in the 1930s, 1940s, that was rhymed. Not like today, you have a free voice, which I don't really enjoy. Mm. But rhymed poetry is like songs. The words rhyme at the end. So often, I would know how to pronounce this word on the third line. But because I knew it had to rhyme with the word on the first line, this and this, I knew how to pronounce it, plus put the accent in the right place. in the heart of Manhattan. At the age of 10, I became deaf, was sick from spinal meningitis. I was in a coma for more than a week. When I came to, found all the auditory nerves were burned out, completely deaf. I went back to the same public hearing schools again. Mm. Had no support services, no interpreters, no note takers, nothing. Teachers were helpful. They checked with me before and after each class. I would sit in a row mm -mm, over here and over here would be hearing friends, mm -hmm. another friend I knew. Teacher would talk maybe about something on geography, bring down the map, pointing out things. My friend over here would 
page 47, I sign, page 47, me, oh, okay, mm -mm -mm. page 47, I wouldn't have would read, mm. you could say I, quote, read my way through school, then to laugh, because often I wouldn't understand the teachers at all, and probably they weren't even speaking about the lesson in the book. So I would take often a book, a novel, or a book of poetry, take it out from my desk and just sit and read, read, read. Mm. I developed an early interest in literature that way. That influenced my mm, life, career decision later on. Well, I married a deaf woman who came from St. Louis. Our son, Ron, was born 1951. We taught Ron finger spelling sometimes, but we always talked to him because we were determined that he would get involved with his hearing and peers. And he did. He got involved in baseball, a little league team that I also coached. My wife was a scorekeeper and strong fan. And I remember our team would often use secret signals and finger spell. <laughs> it was a good way to give a sign without the other team catching on. Yeah, Strong during those years, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, hmm, became more interested in signs. He started to be proud that he could be, quote, interpreter for his stepfather sometimes with the team. that I am retired. <laughs> I don't exactly sit in the rocking chair. <laughs> I've been working on finally completing my collection of poems that I expect to have published next year. Also hope to revive a book that I hope co order some years ago called The Silent Muse and Charles V of Poetry by the Death. I hope that I will always be involved in, in helping to develop the cultural growth achievement of deaf people because I feel that is the area where deaf people can be very creative. We have them succeed in technology now. They're successful there. They succeeded as teachers. And in the arts, we want to add that fourth R in education, reading, <laughs> writing, arithmetic, and Art.
I always thought something would happen to me that might sound a little bit strange, but I thought I would lose my eyesight. I had plans, I suppose, to, to be a musician. Most people, I'd say, thought I would probably be a concert pianist. It never, never, never crossed my mind that I might lose my hearing. It was just something I can imagine that was so unimaginable that it never crossed my mind. When I lost my hearing, I was a singer in my name. I became ill, and the medicine that they used was to save my life. And um, in the course of saving my life, I went into a coma and I awakened. I was dead. this idea about deafness. And um, one day I was passing by uh, downtown or someplace and I saw a guy on the street who had a cup. I don't remember how much money I had. It wasn't a lot, but whatever it was, I gave it all to that person and I cried and I cried. Oh, it was so sad. The person was deaf, you know, and um, he gave me a card. And I just, oh, I was very depressed. I could just see myself standing on a corner, you know, um, a short time from then with my cup or whatever I needed to get by. Um, a friend of my aunt had a nephew who was a tenant, guy he's dead. And uh, she contacted him to let me know about there was a school, it was a college for deaf people. I went to Washington, and um, I thought I would go through Gaida like a breeze. It would be very easy for me. I don't think I was cocky, but I had been a Dean's List student all my life. And uh, I thought, there's no way that these deaf people are smarter than I am. And that was a lie. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't understand sign language. Everybody could read my lips, and I kept telling them, but I have more lips than you do. <laughs> you know, you have more to read than I do. And um, I came from the South, and it was a white school. I was determined that I was going to have a good time. I don't think it ever crossed my mind that I might learn something, you know. I was just determined that I was going in there and I was going to beat this thing, and if they didn't like it, well, that was their problem. I was going to have a lot of fun. I came to Rochester, and um, I was offered a job here as an education specialist. I don't know what I thought, but I didn't think my job would be primarily teaching. I have worked in just about every area of general education. I've taught classes from alcohol and drugs to adjusting to deafness. I have gone from liking it to not liking it to despising it to enjoying it. I love my students. Uh, I love working with them. I have a ball. Some of them do, too. Yeah. Um, I like to see them um, make progress. I like to see them grow. And when I see them in plays or on TV or getting their degree, oh, I feel wonderful. I'm just the other mother. You know? I don't mind being the designated hitter, <laughs> the designated 
hit her. I, I don't mind being the... I don't know why I'm using these words. I can't say them. The surrogate mother. <laughs> I don't mind being anything as long as I play a small part in my students becoming successful. Some students will, they won't think that they are becoming successful, but I feel that any students who ends up doing what they want to do and it's not bothering somebody else, then they are successful. I can remember one of my instructors back in my first freshman year in RIT in photo. He taught us the first day of class that each and every one of you one day will be an engineer. And it only takes one thing to be that. And that was just common sense. I took a job in engineering after I left college, went into IBM, did some engineering work in photo engineering, that was. And then I, they had a project for me. They estimated the project would be like two, two to three years to do, was to develop a new photo lab. Well, I completed that job in a year and a half. Not three years, but half that time. I was given an award, an informal award, for completing that job, participating in a lot of the um, team meetings they had, uh, resolving some problems they had, designing that lab. And it was a very good you know, project for me to begin with. It was something that gave me the opportunity to prove that, yes, I'm deaf, but I ain't the same as you, or the guy next to you, or anybody down the street. All I need to do is given that opportunity to prove it. I do have uh, a very active life outside of IBM after hours. I think with racquetball, I really enjoy it because it's an individual sport that you really got to be good at. It can be a very mean sport, too. You get some of these little burn spots on your knees. <laughs> I constantly got to keep active because it, it keeps the mind fresh as well, too. But that's not just the real reason. I think the real reason is I enjoy people and I want to continue being within the hearing community. We weren't sure when they found out that I was um, hearing impaired. Um, I can remember one day telling the teacher I wasn't hearing what was said. And the teacher said, well, cup your hand behind your ear. That didn't really help, and I guess that's where it all began to come to surface that I was not hearing most everything that I was supposed to. But I think what it really started to change is when I left high school, I wasn't thinking to myself, oh, I'm deaf, I'm one of them. I wouldn't think that I would want to go to a deaf institute. But um, it came down to that I had to go to college if I wanted a good job. That was one of the most memorable days when I first arrived at the campus. My parents was there with me. And I can always remember the expression on their face, what they said to me on that first day when we drove up. When we came up to the, the dormitory of NTID, it was like five or six deaf people in the front of the building just tiny. Immediately, I'm in the back seat. My parents just like turned around. And they just gave me this look. And then my mother says, you want to be like that? Now, the things I'm thinking here now, they, they think that people were using their hands or standing were abnormal. Well, that's typical for most people in the United States, hearing people that don't know what it's like to be deaf, that that's a form of communication that they were using. My manager got a phone call one day, and we to this day, we don't know where that came from or how they got it. We got a call from Rochester, New York, marketing office. It was interesting to have me work as a system engineer. I was wondering if I would have been interested. I go, marketing, <laughs> tough job. <laughs> I mean, you're dealing with customers every day you're on the phone. You're really working your own hours. Then it come to me, occur to me, how many deaf people were in marketing? None that I knew of. <laughs> and he said, is it possible? But I guess after all the years of what I put in, the engineering, the personnel, I still had that drive to go forward in what I want to do, to do something more challenging. There are no limits on what I can do or what anybody can do. The only difference is 
but I have a hearing impairment, it may take a little bit longer, but wherever I'm going, it's not going to stop me. It won't stop me from what I'm going to try to do. Thank you.